Um, hello everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Anas Rahman and my first supervisor is Dr. Venki and my second supervisor is Prof. Debbie Ingram. Uh, I'll try to give an overview of what I've been doing for the past three years. Um, and I understand it's almost lunchtime, so I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Um, so my study can be divided into three main parts. The first one was the clicker up oh, here. All right. So the first one is to conduct a three-dimensional hydrodynamic analysis of the Penton Firth region. And then the second part of my study, we look at the methodology of the implementation of a um, turbine uh, in the 3D domain. And the last one is to implement a three-dimensional tidal turbine, a full-scale uh, tidal turbine into the regional scale model. So in this presentation, I'll be giving an overview of the second part of my study, which is the validation of the turbine representation. So uh, the objective of most numerical models nowadays is to make the representation of the turbine as simple as possible, while at the same time still be able to satisfactorily approximate the effects it has on the surrounding flow. And in 3D runs modeling, four commons methods are widely used to simulate the presence of a turbine. So from the actuator disk, BEM, actuator lines, as well as a fully resolved blade models. And obviously the choice of these models will be depending on the um, applications that we are interested in. For example, if you are interested in capturing the details of the flow passing through a turbine, then perhaps we'll go for the fully resolved blade models. And I think Angus Critch is the expert in this field. And, but if you are interested in looking at the interaction between devices uh, in, in the regional scale model, then perhaps we'll use the actual to this uh, approach since it is more computationally efficient. So the actuator, uh, actuator concept has been widely used before to compute the weight decay for tidal turbine. However, most of these studies um, using the actuator disk involve uh, a very, very small scale um, domain. For example, the diameter in most of the studies, uh, as I listed here, uh, the diameter was about 0.1 meter, which is very, very small. So the problem with this small uh, study is that the essential parameters uh, such as the mesh density as well as the number of vertical layers cannot be replicated uh, in the larger scale domain. So my motivation is quite simple, basically, to model a full scale tidal turbine with a diameter of about 20 meter uh, using the actual to this concept. All right, so this study was conducted using the Telemac uh, 3D uh, software, which is an open source uh, software. The forces uh, or the approximated forces applied by the turbine into the domain can be calculated using the additional source term here within the RANS equation of momentum and mass conservation. And the S term here, the SI term here, the source term can be computed using this equation where K is the resistant coefficient while the X, delta XT over here is the disk thickness uh, that we're interested in. And to calculate K, we need to uh, use another equation um, given here, equation 4, where at Benz limit, we can get the coefficient of thrust about 0.89, which we can get K equals to 2. So in validating the models, so I have to choose whether to implement my model straight away into a regional scale model, a large scale model, or should I go for a small scale domain first? So in the end, I decided to choose a small, do, a small scale domain for validation purposes because it is more manageable. And then if, for example, we encounter any problems uh, with our coding uh, in implementation of the turbine, it's easier to be rectified than in the larger scale domain. So this figure shows the schematic diagram of the domain that I use in my study. Um, the output from the numerical models was compared with an experimental setup by a researcher from uh, Southampton University. So this table basically summarizes the difference between the experimental setup as well as my model. 
So for example, the max flow speed in the flume configuration in the experimental setup was about 0.3, while my numerical model used a maximum flow speed of 3 meters per second. So as for the implementation of the tidal turbine, uh, the implementation of the actuator disk in the uh, numerical domain, the structured grid was specifically used to define the enclosure of the turbine since it helps to maintain the features as well as to help maintaining the shape of the turbine uh, when we calculate the actuator this uh, momentum source term. So the structured grid over here, as you can see here, was purposely made to be larger than the dimension of the turbine to allow for numerical tolerance upon the calculation of the momentum source term. And in this study, I used 24 vertical layers um, in my domain. And uh, I think that's it, yep. OK, so this table summarizes some of the model inputs that I used. Uh, this study was uh, run using the hydrodynamic uh, assumptions. The turbulence at the inlet was calculated or imposed using the K-epsilon model, where the turbulence intensity, Ti, uh, was set to about 5%. Uh, percent, uh, which was approximated from the experimental setup. And then for the parametric study, a few parametric, uh, parametric studies was conducted. The first one was the turbulent length scale to see whether it has any influence on the model. So surprisingly, um, it has basically I tested uh, four values for the length scale and none of, uh, basically they give an identical result. So next is to look at mesh dependency, uh, whether the mesh uh, resolution has an impact on the output of the model. So this shows the refinement zone of the mesh density. So three val values were tested from 2 meter, 5 meter, as well as 10 meter. And interesting, well, maybe as to be expected, a coarser, grid, a coarser grid give a poor correlation compared to a fine grid of 2 meter. So for the next simulation, I decided to use a 2 meter grid res resolution since it gives the best um, correlation with the experimental uh, data. Then for the bottom um, boundary condition, most of the small scale study use non-slip condition, uh, but in my study, because I'm using large scale simulation, the non-slip condition cannot be used since it requires a very refined mesh resolution near the bottom, uh, near the bottom of the uh, domain. So, because this has to, uh, this how should I say, the mesh re resolution near the bottom has to be very refined, since uh, it has to satisfy the wall function. So, the use of non-slip boundary condition requires uh, the use of bed friction. So, we have uh, a lot of uh, people discuss about the bad, bad, uh, bad friction today. So I guess what I can say is that some uh, I tested four values using Chazy formulation. So obviously we see some differences, but the best correlation from here was by using Chazy 44. So that's why I used Chazy 44 for the default option. Then to test the domain width. So domain width um, is quite important because um, it relates to the blockage ratio of the model. But uh, by testing three values, so the experimental uh, study gave a blockage ratio of about 0.019, but by using these three value, basically they give a quite identical result, which means the tested value has no significant influence on the model. So I decided to use with the medium domain width uh, to save some computational time. Next is to test the resistance coefficient, which is, I think, the most important parameters when implementing the actuator disk uh, approach. So three values uh, was, were tested from 0.61 until 0.97. The grid strike, uh, the turbine enclosure was set to be constant at 2 meter, and the T thickness was also set constant to 2, to two meter. Excuse me. So this is the result using uh, k equals to 2, which corresponds to CT 0.86. Uh, so the, uh, the top plot shows you the velocity deficit of the models, and the bottom plot shows you the turbulent intensity from the results. 
So my numerical output is shown by the blue line while the published data is shown by the black uh, dots over here. So interestingly, if you look at the top plots uh, for the velocity deficit, the models obviously shows a very good correlation um, in comparison of the uh, experimental setup. So we, as you can see, you, can, uh, you get a nice velocity deficit uh, in the near wake and then up to far wake where the velocity recovers, you get a quite identical uh, agreement. But if you look at the bottom plots for the table intensity, at the top um, half of the domain, you get quite a good correlation roughly. But you look at the bottom half, then you can see the numerical output is not slightly, but shows an obvious diversion from the experimental data. So we think this might be caused by the hydrostatic assumptions that we use, uh, that basically the solver cannot appropriately resolve the turbulence in the bottom half of the channel. The same characteristic or the same output was shown by other uh, CT values as well. So we, sh we obviously think this is caused by the, uh, by the hydrostatic assumption that we use. So if we look at the center line velocity deficit over here, so the line over here shows uh, the experimental uh, data, while the dotted lines here shows the numerical output. But it's quite encouraging to see that the models managed to give, uh, how should I say, the appropriate trend, I would say. So we can see the trend from a higher thrust to a lower thrust uh, followed the trend by the experimental setup. Um, but as you can also see here, the models give a slightly underestimated value of the velocity deficit. And we think this is quite acceptable because the k value used in the numerical domain was only an approximation and uh, not, not an exact value like used in the experimental setup. So I think to conclude, well, the 3D runs attributed this approach was uh, able to replicate uh, the experimental setup result, and we are quite happy with that. And although not shown in this uh, presentation, uh, I also tested uh, the interactions between the turbines using the attributed this approach, and a good result was obtained and was validated against another experimental setup. Uh, I also tested the grid density to check the dependency of the numerical output uh, for the, uh, in relation with the uh, structured grid density. And I not, uh, we noticed that the structured grid plays an import, the size of the structured grid plays an, a very important role in giving um, an accurate uh, output of the model. So if you use a, a coarser grid, for example, then your output will definitely deviate uh, so much from the uh, experimental setup uh, data. Then I also tested the non-hydrostatic um, solver, which managed to solve the deviation that we observed previously on the bottom half of the channel for the turbulent intensity. And oh, I, th I think that's it. So what's next, or what is the final stage of this study is basically to implement or to apply whatever I've learned from the validation in, and implement the full-size standard turbine into a regional scale model of the pendulum first. So you can see here the inner sound as um, shown by colleague, uh, our colleagues before. So this is my preliminary, preliminary result, which shows some reductions of velocity, which I'm quite happy um, so far. I think that's it. Uh, just before I end my presentation, uh, I think this relates to every one of us. Uh, I would like to bring this, hi or I would like to highlight about a syndrome called copper tunnel. Uh, a lot of us does a lot of numerical modeling in our daily tasks, and we may not realize it, but if you keep on doing the same repetitive work, for example, clicky mouse for an hour or two, and at the end of the day, you will, re you will realize um, sharp pain or a tingling sens a sensation uh, near your fingers and also your wrist. So that's probably a sign that you have a couple tunnel syndrome. And I strongly encourage you guys to be alert of this thing because 
it can happen to anyone. All right, uh, I think that's it for my presentation. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.